Welcome to the podcast, A Drink with Derek. Follow comedian Derek Richards on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And don't forget to subscribe to his YouTube channel and watch all episodes of the podcast. Now grab a drink and join your host, Derek Richards. This is amazing, man. It is so good to be here. If you knew the stress this week has been. And on top of it all, I get a phone call from one of my best friends who invites me to come over because apparently they just had a baby. <laughs> and when, you're, when your friends have babies, they expect you to come over and hug and touch and take pictures with this little person that they made and you can't say no or you're a dick. Um, I understand, parents, it's a huge moment in your life. I don't have any children, but it's apparently important. And I go over and I'm sitting, I reluctantly agree, I'm sitting on his couch, I'm holding his firstborn baby in my hand. I look down and I suddenly realize that this is the ugliest fucking baby I have ever seen in my life. And some of you can laugh about that, I appreciate that. Some of you got real uptight all of a sudden. Those are my favorite people too, by the way. You can't say that about a baby. Uh, every baby is a gorgeous little gift from God. They're beautiful little angels tossed down here to make our lives happier. Exactly, everyone in this room has seen that little half gremlin son of a bitch running through Walmart. <laughs> and knocking stuff off a shelf with a leather wing and a horn. And a beak. What? <laughs> What if I'm dating a girl and she spits out one of these chupacabras and, and then I have to hit something with a shovel? That is... Stop, not the baby, the girl with the bad DNA. Um, and before you get mad, if you have an ugly baby, love it, you should. You did it. Uh, <laughs> hey, it's A Drink With Derek. Derek Richards here in Las Vegas. With me right now is uh, my guest, Slade Ham in Houston, Texas, snow covered Houston, Texas, most of Houston with power outages, Houston, Texas. It's uh, I'm glad you got some. Uh, I'm glad you somehow got the gerbils to uh, crank up the power over at uh, over at the uh, Casa de Ham and uh, appreciate you being here. Slade Ham, three comedy albums here on Sirius XM Satellite Radio. He has an awesome podcast called the Whiskey Brothers Podcast. Also, you can see the uh, Whiskey Brothers Special on Amazon Prime. Is it what's the name of that? Is it just called the Whiskey Brothers? That's it. Whiskey Brothers, Amazon Prime. Watch it. Also, uh, you've seen this guy I, like, all over the planet. I highly recommend you check out his social media. His Instagram pictures are Nat Geo quality from around the world. And uh, I've been it's excited. You and I first had a chance to work together, meet at uh, doing an Armed Forces Entertainment tour with uh, Don Barnhart. You and I, you and I'm trying to remember where that tour fell in my life because I was experienced. There was, there was a stretch there. I think that was 14, 15, 16, somewhere in there, there was a stretch where I was, that travel was my salvation. And I seem to remember uh, there was a stretch in Kosovo that I think we were on together maybe, or it was somewhere in there where we were stuck in an airport and having to drink a bottle of whiskey before we got through security. And uh, it was a very cool point in my life. And I just remember that the friends I made in that era uh, have kind of stuck with me and I appreciate it. So uh, how cool to become in full circle like this. We had, uh, we had so much fun. That was, and when I told that, uh, when Don Barnhart told me that uh, you were on the tour and he goes, do you know Slade? And I go, no, I never met him before. He goes, you guys will be brothers. <laughs> And we immediately bonded over our love of uh, Irish whiskey. And uh, and before we go any further, I will ask you, because you're a Whiskey Brothers podcast, you guys always knock off a, a bottle of whiskey. Ooh, an episode. Uh, I, you guys are my spirit animals. What is your your best and worst whiskey? Who? Um, so best, best changes for me um, by the mood I'm in. You know what I mean? There's a, I'm the same way. Just, I'm an, I'm an Eagle rare guy. If you just sit me down and go, Hey, pick something off the shelf. That's probably what I'm going to grab. Uh, on the same note, there have been, you know, bottles of whiskey that have, that have meant something to me at the time I drank them that could never possibly, you, nothing could ever taste better than that in its entire world. On, on the ugly side, um, it, what is not relative is Yukon gold. 
That is the most garbage swill that has ever been picked up out of a cup stuck in the Hudson River or wherever they took it and then peed in it and stuck that in a blender with seven dead lizards and put out a couple of cigarette butts and then handed it to Texas to use as a dip cup. And then if you put all that in a freezer for about six months and leave it out in the rain for another six months after that and then put it underground and ferment it like some kimchi, it's still, still more drinkable than Yukon Gold. Hang on one second. Hey, babe, you know that uh, case of Yukon Gold we were going to send to Slade <laughs> for Christmas? It's not. Just, just, yeah, man. No, it's not going to. Yeah, I'll save this up the postage. <laughs> the cut, you travel extensively. We'll get into that here in a second. Tell me the country that you were the most drunk in and what local beverage did it to you? We, uh, soju would be the beverage. Uh, we were in Korea. Uh, it's a South, it's a, it's a Korean rice wine, I guess is the best way to explain soju. Okay. Uh, it's a, so somewhere in the family of sake maybe, but it's a sleeper. You can drink it all you want while you're sitting down and you, you never feel so you feel lucid the whole time. And an hour later, when you stand up to go to the bathroom, all these bottles of soju climb on your back and weigh you down and you fall onto the floor. And that's, that's, that must be what it is because it's, it's happened to everyone I've ever seen drink it. Everyone, oh, Soju, the sleeper, right? It, I was, we were in, we were in Korea. It was me and J.R. Brow. I don't know if you know J.R. Yep, uh, great fantastic guy. Fantastic comic. And uh, we had ended up, we had been bar hopping all night in Seoul and we ended up in this bar and it's, you know how bar owners are? They're, they're the guys who, they know all the bar tricks. This was before I owned a bar. This was, they know everything. You can't beat them in drinking games. Uh, so we'd been doing shots all night. We walk in hammered and then I start getting into drinking contests with the bar owner who is trouncing me uh, with every, I'm, but I'm learning all these new tricks. He does the one with the, uh, you ever do the deal where it's like the, he'll line up, you line up four quarters and you put a shot glass here and you go, you have to match my moves, right? I'll move the quarter here, you move the quarter here. I move the quarter here, you move the quarter. If I take a shot, you take a shot. So that's the game, back and forth. Well, I do that, and he takes a sip of his shot, I take a sip of mine. He moves a quarter, I move a quarter. He takes a sip, I take a sip, he moves a quarter, and then he spits his shot back into his glass. And I went, you son of a bitch, I swallowed mine. It, uh, that's how he beat me. So it would be games like that, where he's just, I'm being out by a drunk Korean guy because I'm a drunk American. And... Uh, yeah, me and JR, I don't, we, we ended up walking almost the entirety of Seoul trying to get back to the hotel that was right across the street from the bar where I lost all my money and dignity. <laughs> Your travel experiences, when did you start going everywhere and doing stuff? Was it tied into the, did you start traveling when you were doing Armed Forces Entertainment Tours or were you doing this before that even Oh, became part of the picture because because I, your travels take you well beyond doing the you know armed forces entertainment stuff all of a sudden like i'm following you on instagram and i'm like oh look he's in bora bora and then it's like <laughs> like oh he's in he's in the north pole he's 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 there he's riding he's riding dancer yeah, what with are you santa doing in niger <laughs> i know right it's literally and, and i'm like oh, he's got a green screen behind him he's not even leaving his place in houston he's just it's He's just, he's just very creative with Photoshop. He can put himself anywhere. So no, I mean, did your, did your uh, love for travel and your experiences doing this, did this start way before doing the Armed Forces Entertainment Tours? It, it weirdly, it's, it's kind of donutted by Armed Forces and, or by, by military tours in general. I took, a, uh, I took a gig in 2001. So it would have been September. Well, when I took the gig, it was like June. And I was mm -hmm. so far down on the list. When I, when I got on the list for the gig, it was like June. I was really far down on this list. It was a company called Lone Wolf Entertainment. Uh, they pay you like $2 a show to go all over the world and uh, play your heart out. Uh, for, for, and it's, you know, it's for the troops, they tell you. And you're like, but you're a private company. Okay, I see how this works. Um, these mm -hmm. guys were, but they, they were for me. I'd never been anywhere. And I, I've been doing comedy for, Derek, I swear to God, a year and a half. Right. I started comedy in April of 2000. So this would have been middle of 2001. And I'm I'm hey, I want to go. And they go, oh, sure, we'll put you on the list. And then 9-11 happened and everybody scheduled to go dropped off and they get down to me on the list. And they go, do you want to go? Well, I'm this 23 year old, you know, brash Texan. I'm the ugliest American you've ever seen. Like, I've never been anywhere. I've gone from Texas to Florida and maybe once to St. Louis. Like that was my whole time on a plane ever. 
and they go, do you want to go to Germany? And this was right after 9-11. So I went there. I think my passport, I have to look back, but it was like October 6th or something, within a month of 9-11. And it was so eye-opening for me. And I was admitted, like I said, the ugly American. You know, I'm, I'm well, Kaiser Schlout and Krieger Kraut. You know, I'm, I'm that dude. <laughs> Y'all like the letter K over here. <laughs> that guy. And I don't. I don't look back on those years fondly because I do now I'm like, Oh my God, it would kill me if I saw me acting that way. But at the time it was me learning and it, it weirdly got me so into like, well, if Germany's like this, what are other places like compared to, you know, and you're this kid who's never been anywhere. So you, you take another tour two years later because you survived that one and you see Japan and then you go to Bahrain, which is the weirdest place. I was there. I remember being in the Abu Ghraib airport, or the, uh, not the airport. when the Abu Ghraib photos came out, I was in the airport in Bahrain. And that was like this odd time as an American who's in the Middle East for the first time. And nothing mm-hmm. on the news is about anything but what American soldiers did to, you know, uh, Muslim prisoners. And it just, all of that kind of shook me awake. And it's, it, I ended up traveling a lot in between then and maybe 2010 on my own. And then when 2010 rolled around, I really sank in with AFE and uh, I've kind of become one of their head tour leaders. And that's taken me to just some incredible places that I punctuate by staying over and visiting wherever else I can on the on the edges. Yeah, because you kind of stick around in whatever location there, that it ends in and then you end up using that as like a pivot point to go taking off someplace else. Where, What's the scariest situation that you've been in? Traveling because you go, I mean, you literally have when people, when, when I tell you that Slade literally has a backpack and you are as minimalist as they come, I mean, you've got a backpack and your baseball cap, t shirt, jeans, shoes, and you're gone. I mean, you just vanish into the, into the woods, into the wilderness, you, you, a mountaintop, you, you, you rent a Sherpa and you just take off. I mean, what's the, uh, most whacked out scary situation that you got yourself into where you went, I may not come out of this. There's, there's, all right. So there's, there, there are many, 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 many weird moments in just the, the wilderness. You know what I mean? Where you're either in the mountains of, of, of Canada or you're in uh, Cambodia or there've been some places where I've just, I've ventured out well past my ability, I guess. And, and it gets kind of sketchy. Go, Oh, am I going to, I'm not going to die, but this sucks. Uh, more scary to me, um, I was in I was in the Philippines. I had done I was doing this amazing tour, and this was right before I went to Cambodia. I had, I was doing this tour. I was in Australia and Guam with with our buddy Barnhart, and mm-hmm. I was leaving that tour to go lead another tour in Europe. So I was going to Portugal, Spain, Italy, uh, that that region, the Med. And AFE wanted to fly, because it's the government, they want to fly you back because it's the cheapest thing to do. Well, we'll fly you, but it doesn't make any sense to leave you there. We'll fly you home for two days. You can sleep for two days and then we'll fly you even further east. And I went, how about if you guys will just fly me from Phnom Penh to Lisbon, I'll handle everything in between, right? So I'll just get myself from Australia into Cambodia. I'll spend a week and a half there and then I'll go pick up my tour. Um, I stopped in the Philippines. Derek. I'd never been. It was a chance. I was like, you know what? If I overnight in the Philippines, I can at least chalk it off and say I've been there, right? Just an overnight. I get off in the airport. I catch a cab to my hotel. I get out of the car. I put my stuff in there, and I walk right out to go find a drink. I'm just like, whatever. It's a drink. We'll have one drink. We'll go to bed. We got a flight. I don't know how many I had. I don't know. I don't know. It's the Philip. It's Manila. You can't. There's no control in this. Life just happens. I remember waking up the next morning with the most, you know, those hangovers, right? Those just, you know them. I know every single hangover imaginable. Okay. So three of those in a, in a bucket together, slosh it around. Ugh. I've got one of those. And I've got to get to the airport and I call a cab and, the, and I come out and the, the sun is just blazing in my eyes. And the cab driver, I get in his cab and he starts just, ha- it's, their roads are suggestive in some cities right Uh if if the sidewalk fits better we'll take it and we just so we're just we're flitting through traffic and it's fast and the lights are hitting me and i'm uh the motion and the and then suddenly we stop and the cab driver jumps up and gets out of his car and runs around to my side and then just starts peeing like i get he just had to pee (laughs) 
Why not, buddy? I, I get it. So then he jumps back in the car and he starts going back towards the airport. And all of this is happening like a fever dream. It's just, it is just, oh, what is going on in my life? And we get to the airport and I've, I've already decided just you're keeping the tip, buddy, because I'm not letting you give me change back with that hand. And then we, 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 we park and I, I go to open my door. And when I do, this other cab pulls in next to us. And as my door opens, just rakes the side of that other guy's car. And now I'm immediately alert, right? Like, oh shit, I'm, I don't, I've seen locked up abroad. I don't know how this goes. So I start trying to talk to the guy and he starts yelling at me and the other dude starts yelling at me. And it's, I don't speak Tagalog, or what, I, I don't, I don't it's, but it, I feel like a, you know how like a dog or a cat must feel when they're being yelled at? With mm -hmm. you just, I have no idea what's being said, but I know oh, yeah. nobody's happy with me. <laughs> And I'm just like, okay, well, I didn't do it, dude. I don't know what else to tell you. And uh, he says something else. I was like, man, just be that big America. I was like, I didn't fucking do it. And he kind of cowers down a little bit and goes to get a cop. And I take that as my opportunity to, to bail, right? So I go get in line and I'm just, my heart's beating because I don't, I can't pay for a Filipino cab. And I, you know, they're going to make it my fault. So I'm standing in line before you get into the airport. That's how the line is at the airport in Manila. And they have security before you get in. So I'm standing there and I'm just watching, looking around, waiting to see what happens. And finally this cop comes up and he goes, he asked me what happened. And I tell him real quick and he goes, okay. He goes, I'll be right back. Heart's beating. I'm like, I can't wait for this dude. I go, technically he told me he'd be right back. He didn't tell me I had to wait. He just said he was calm. I'm like, I'm doing all the technicality. He didn't tell me. Oh, that. yeah. So I just skedaddle on through and I get into the airport. And now I know I'm like, if this dude sees me again, I'm in trouble. Now I've fled the scene. I've already done whatever I've done. I'm terrified. I've got my ticket. I'm like, if I can just get through security. And then I was like, Derek, racism is, is bad, right? But you know how like sometimes... <laughs> Sometimes it's hard to identify different people of di like like to note the differences in different races, right? Like if sure. you showed me thirty Filipino people and told me to find Tom, it would take me a minute because I don't see Filipino people every day. Like I see white people. I'm yes, right. I'm making a scientific point. My, I, I'm, I'm with, with you. Couch, I'm sitting on the couch with my buddy Sam. You know Sam Damaris. Black guy, yes, locked halfway down his back. Mm -hmm. It's the difference between them showing something on the news where they show a, a, a sketch and I go, man, that could be any black dude. And Sam goes, damn, Jay robbed a liquor store. Like that's the, that's the difference, right? Exactly. So I'm counting on the fact that while this guy may be very adept at recognizing all of the, the different Filipino people in the airport, Americans probably all look the same to this guy. So I just changed sweaters and I put a different hat on and I put my sunglasses on and Derek is God is my witness. This same cop comes up to me in the internal line, waiting to get into security with my heart pounding and asks me if I've seen another American. Wow. So you skated from that. You were using your, I, I love your technicalities, by the way. You're like, well, he didn't you know, he, he didn't tell me to stay. So you're, so you're using all the uh, all the legal stuff that you learned on Law and I'm Order. Technicality and hopeful racism. That's what I've got my hopes and dreams written on. That's, yeah. That's got to be the name of your next album. Hopeful racism. Be the name of your next, next album, Hopeful Racism. It's, it's, uh, it's, the only, it's the only good thing that has ever come from racism was my salvation in the Philippines. I, I don't know. Maybe I wouldn't have gotten in trouble. But I also was just in my head, like, am I going to be, are they going to cane me? Is that Singapore? Or is that, you know, you're like, I don't know how this ends. Yeah, it wouldn't have ended well had you ended up in, in jail in the Philippines. I, that, that's all I know. I know it wouldn't have gone, this will be a totally different story right now. Totally. But instead, it ended up, you know, it was an absolutely beautiful uh, stay in Manila. And as much as the headache was there, the, the, it gave you a good story. And I, you know, I want to go back now. You know. must have had a stroke. No, you don't want to go back because now they got your picture all over the place. <laughs> What if I show it's just my, my passport photo tacked to like at the post office? <laughs> yeah, you're, you're like now the Al Capone of the Philippines. <laughs> if you ever come back, you're going to be like Jeffrey Epstein. As soon as you land, every every <laughs> Filipino authority is going to be on the plane. 
that cop tells stories about me to his kids like Kaiser Sose. He goes, and then poof, he was gone. Then he just vanished. <laughs> <laughs> you were, I want to talk about something that you and I had discussed a couple months ago. I was lit up here at the house and uh, I gave you a call and we were on the phone for like probably an hour. Just, oh God, yeah. Just shooting the shit, catching up. And one of the things that, um, that I appreciate about you is your entrepreneurial spirit. And I want to talk about your, you got a book called Until All the Dragons Are Dead, because not only are you a hilarious comedian, you do some brilliant photography, uh, you also are a, 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 a brilliant writer as well. And your book, what is, tell, tell what, what's that about? So it's, it's called Until All the Dragons Are Dead. I, I've been, there's, there's a lot, you and I know, right? Stand up is very one dimensional in the sense that it's all got to be run through the filter of funny. You can make your point or you can, you can cover all the other things you want to cover, but you ultimately have to put that cap of funny on it or it doesn't work. Even in the, even in the most serious of moments, like a Dave Chappelle who takes you down one of those, when he broke the tension with the, and in all that time, Cosby raped. 60 something you know that whole if you're going to be serious for that long that punch has to be there mm -hmm. at the end and i love that about stand up but i also like exploring not having to do that i guess just being able to toy with other i want to say emotions but other mediums and, and and words and things that don't always have to end in a punchline and mm -hmm. that was sort of the impetus of the book now it's funny it's it's probably 80 percent funny but I also talk about my dad's death in there, and I talk about uh, some other moments. That Filipino story, parts of it are in there. The uh, there, There's some other serious stuff that I kind of get to, and I think it marries well. Um, so it's, it's, it's I don't know, 20-something essays from uh, all around the world and just from these travels and some of the stuff I've learned, and it's a little bit philosophy and a little bit stand-up and a little bit travelogue, and uh, – it's enjoyable. Um, I'm shifting gears a little bit for the second book, but uh, it's 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 a fun style to write in. So uh, I think I think folks will dig it. Now you talk about you get personal in it about obviously your father passing away. I mean, do you discuss things about yourself in there? I mean, because everybody always says, listen, comedians have something screwed up inside of them. Right. What uh, would you say? What would you say is screwed up inside of you? And do you discuss that in the book at all? I don't. So one, I don't I don't prescribe to that myth. Um, they, I, I'm not a big, those labels, those things like that. When you go, ah, oh, comedians have to be screwed up. Well, suddenly now I have to, I have to take that into account every time I figure stuff out. I go, oh, is this what a screwed up person would do? Is this what someone who is depressed would do or someone who is anxious would do or someone who all those right. things that we as comics tend to t take ownership of all that shit gets in the way for me like that's that's the stuff that's kept me my whole life from doing anything so that myth that comics are these broke screwed up animals is the first thing i decided to get rid of uh in myself so yes to your, to your question about is it personal in the book uh but not to the not to the not to the in a tone of um, here's what's wrong with me. It's kind mm -hmm. of explored like, oh, here's, here's who I am. And let's, let's fit. Cause I don't, cause here's what it really comes down to those things, those negative things. When you embrace them, it gives you this permission to keep wearing them. Right. Mm -hmm. if I, if I look at myself and go, oh, wow, there's some screwed up stuff. Let's explore it. Let's look at it. Let's figure out how much of this needs to continue with me and how much of this I need to drop off now. And I think that's maybe what I do in some of the uh, stories in that book is just explore those elements of myself. And I think by the time you get to the end of it, you go, oh, I see what turned you into the guy you are now, at least during that stretch. Well, I think I don't think comedians are really any more messed up than anybody else out there. We just happen to be on stage and can turn some of our jacked up stories into something yes. funny that, again, there's a reason why everybody can relate to stuff. There's a reason why comedians go up on stage and audiences laugh at relatable things, because I think they see some of these things in themselves. Yeah. We just ended up making it funny. Yes. And, and, and to that end, the more specific you are, the more an audience, I used to think when I, when I first started talking about um, this, this really horrible relationship I was in for a big chunk of my twenties, right? I was in it for seven and a half years. And mm -hmm. Got out of the relationship right about the time that Christopher Titus was taping his uh, fifth annual Into the World tour. Um, it was his second special after Norman Rockwell's Bleeding. 
And he and I were friends at the time, and he called me up and he asked me to open for it for Comedy Central, and I said yes. And then he calls me up a month later and he goes, "Well, here's the, the caveat." He goes, "You can only talk about that relationship you just got out of." And I'm like, "Well, we're this is in January, and we're having this conversation in November, and I'm doing 15 minutes in front of Comedy Central. I'd rather it be my my stuff, right? Like I want to right. fireballs." And he goes, "Yeah, then I'll get somebody else." And I go, "Well." well what? What do you, what do you mean? He goes, you need to do this. He goes, you, he goes, I love what you're doing. He goes, I love you as a comic. He goes, but what you're writing could, he goes, anybody could tell these jokes. And it was to his, I mean, to be truthful, he was right. There was, there was a lot of funny in there, but there wasn't a lot of me in there. Um, mm -hmm. And I went out and I told, I told the story of getting stabbed uh, by her. I told the story of getting pushed off the balcony. I told these horrible stories about this relationship and it, it worked. It was not, it was, you know, light years away from a set. I'd be amazed by if I saw it in a right. movie. but knowing what I had done in terms of right, like going up and just, I'd kind of workshop this at some mics and stuff, but it was still raw and fresh and punchlines were there, but it was unpolished. And when it was done over the next couple of years, the next years, months, as I developed it, what I started to see was, as I'm talking in my mind going, well, it should have been easier. I should have just been talking about, you know, the differences between men and women and man, women leave the toilet seat down and men sure leave it up. And why can't you touch the towels in the bathroom? To me, that was my monkey brain saying that's the lowest common denominator. That's what right. the audience is looking for play to that. And in reality, when I'm going up there talking about the most extreme parts of my life, like who's been stabbed, in the real world who's actually had a knife go into part of their body even a little bit not mm -hmm. too many people but what i found was people started well i haven't been stabbed but i have this is now making my crazy thing seem so much more normal and by normalizing right. that insanity even though insanity doesn't need to be normalized but the going through it part does and that's what i found was more, i would have guys coming up to me after shows telling me their stories. I'm like, you're a cop. You're six foot three. You work in DC. How are you? But you're terrified of this girl you're with. And those would be the conversations we would have. And that's what really pushed me into, man, like talk about it, get into the, get into the nitty gritty of it and let other people make their correlations on their own. And you'll be shocked at how much more often that happens than will ever happen where, they're, they're, where they, where they have a revelation listening to your Tinder bit. You know what I mean? <laughs> so basically all these guys that you met, and in the audiences have dated this wacko broad that you were with. Oh, she got around, Derek. It was a she made it to DC. <laughs> you know, it's so funny. I was thinking about this the other day because I was looking through some pictures and I remember that tour that we did and we were in uh, England. You and I were in London and um oh, yes. yes. the other guys on the tour, the other guys on the tour wanted to go to uh one guy wanted to go to Harrods and get his girlfriend something or whatever it was. Yeah, and so really we're like, OK, I'm not going to go to a grocery store or a, 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 uh, <laughs> a department store. Exactly. So you and I were like, they're like, OK, we'll meet you back over here at whatever time. And we're like, we'll figure it out. You and 20 miles that day. I, we I mean, I, we were both hurting the next day because we'd stop. We're like, oh, pub. Cool. Let's go in, get a uh, get a shot and a beer. Boom. Take off. And we hit all these. We hit as many sites as we could possibly see in London. Yes. And then and it, was, it, it ended with us, though, I think part of the next day's trouble. Did we not get stuck at that train station in the frozen cold waiting to get back? Was that the same day? Yeah, waiting to get a cab back to the base. Yeah. Yeah, because we had the last train out of London going back out to where the base was oh, at. Yes. And, and we couldn't get – and we got there so late because we were like the last train. And that was – there was just us sitting there and that, that we're waiting, we're freezing our ass off in England <laughs> about probably, what was it? Maybe oh. tw 20 miles, 30 miles oh. outside of London. Yeah. 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 Uh, we were, we were, we were, we weren't. Yeah. It was. Yeah. We, that whole day was surreal to me. That's the day. Was that the day that the guy on the, on the train on our, was that into London that day that the guy on the train stopped me and he was listening to my podcast? While yes. Listening to me laugh. Yes. Derek, he had, he literally had, he had it on his, on his phone and he had the Whiskey Brothers podcast logo he, on there. And he heard your laugh and he turned and he pointed at you and he, and he held up the phone. That was, 
<laughs> so cool. It was the weirdest. I was like, this guy's staring at me. Like, why is this guy staring at me? I don't know. I don't know anybody here. Who does he think I look like? Like, what is there some English guy that I don't look like anybody back in America? So is there some English celebrity that he thinks I am? Because this is creepy. And then as soon as we're getting off and he just goes, hey, mate, what's your name? And I go, Slade. And he goes, oh my God. And he holds his phone up. And yeah. he's got the podcast on it. And I was uh-huh. like, the weirdest not that, not that I'm surprised we have fans. Uh, I know, I know we have. I see the metrics. I know where we have fans. No, but, but just the timing of that. Try and do the math on what the intersectional probability is of one of those fans being on that train at the same time I'm on that. I just what a weird convergence of of events. And I was, I was like, hey man, this is gonna sound weird, but can I take a picture with you, fan guy? <laughs> That was that was very surreal. That was funny as hell. I remember because he was sitting like almost like in front of us. Same car on the train. I mean, yeah, was- like right there. And I remember looking over and he and he held up the phone and that was just in- incredibly, uh, <laughs> incredibly surreal. You talk about having the most uh, expensive storage unit in Houston. Oh. <laughs> now, if I'm in I'm I'm in storage wars. I'm standing outside there and I'm bidding on the storage unit. They throw the door open. What do I see inside your storage unit? Well, now you see my house. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I did, I lost, I lost the storage unit that I did have. And I, when my club closed, uh, it was, I put everything in it and I moved to LA. Uh, everything that I didn't, well, no, I moved to LA and I took everything with me. And then I came back from LA when my dad went into the hospital and I stuck everything in storage that didn't, it was all this old club stuff and everything else. And it was, I, you know, you never know what, what you, what you have. Right. Right. Until you, start, until you start looking for it. Um, so years later, uh, as I'm, I'm coming out of what is the brokest time in my entire life. Right. Like I'm just, I had, I had moved back from LA. I've, I've, every dollar I had saved up after my club closed is gone. I paid off the rest of my debt. I'm sleeping on my brother's couch. Uh, he's having another kid and they're like, not kicking me out, but also you got to kind of, you know, like you, just if you saw a place, uh-huh. you know, maybe just can think about it. And I, you know, and I was like, I got $400 in my checking account. This is the lowest I've ever been. And I, I just, and I, I, that was when I chose to quit smoking. It was this whole brilliant time, right? Like I'm not, my dad died, my club's gone. I just broke up with this girl that was, you know, it was a horrible relationship, but I'm, I'm out and single for the first time for this, all of this. I'm like, I'll quit smoking now. That's a wonderful moment. Uh, so in, in, in all of that, I, um, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to remember exactly what I was talking about now. I got sidetracked. Uh, <laughs> I'm sleeping on my brother's couch. I right. go through, I'm, 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 I'm in this new shitty apartment and I'm like, you know what, man? You've got comic books and baseball cards and autograph, like all the stuff that I want to lug with me. I've got this Rolling Stones lithograph that's autographed by those guys and it's framed and it's all, all this collectible stuff that have been in my studio and the a spawn one through 150 and the you know some old Spider Man books. And you sure. can see the comic book art behind me. I'm a, I'm a junkie yeah. for this stuff. And I go, man, I'll just go get it out of the storage unit and I go down there and it's locked and it's not my lock. And then I start talking to the guys that work there and they're like, Oh yeah. Um, so we can let you in the storage unit, but your credit card lapsed, uh, like 13 months ago. So, uh, it's about to go up for auction. So to get in, it's going to cost it's like $2,500 to get into this storage. And I'm just, you're doing the math. Do I have $2,500 worth of stuff in here? I can't even, I'm trying to storage wars myself. I'm like, is what's in there worth what I'm about to have to pay? Hip, that's where I, you know what I mean? It's the, absolutely ridiculous and i i just i had to let it go i'm like i can't go borrow money i'm gonna go get a i'm gonna go get a bridge loan to get us my stuff out of a storage unit this is just ah. somebody's got it i don't know enjoy my well, lithograph well now you had a uh, you had a comedy club in it was in beaumont texas wasn't it yeah yes what what ended up making that when did you get it and what made it go away uh so i i opened it because I believe in I believe in outthinking whatever it is you're up against. You don't have to do exactly what everybody else does, right? If I've got to do and I, I do some things you have to do. You have to pay your dues. Stand up comedy is stand up comedy, bro. You and I both know there is no way through this but to do it. There is it is stage time. It is stage no, there's time. no shortcuts. No. None. 
not. You can pretend you whatever you think about stand up, you have to do stand up to get good at stand up. So I needed stage time. And I also didn't want to have to to be a barista or to have to go stock groceries or to, you know, I didn't want to do that anymore. I wanted to be right. in the creative field so I could focus on that. So I was I was working in radio a little bit um, at the time. I had a morning show with uh, uh, my morning show partner was the sales guy at the radio station. We were creatively looking for what they call NTR in radio, which is non-traditional revenue. So uh -huh. we'd do a station sponsored charity event that was a comedy show and would put sponsors on it. And I would book it out, you know, and we'd book Houston guys that were headliners, but, but strong. And we'd give all the door to charity, but would make the sponsorship money. And we had test driven the model a couple of times. And then the radio station sold uh, while I was in Mexico on a trip. And uh, uh -huh. I came back literally to no job, like station sold in the week I was gone. And my partner at the time was like, well, why don't we do a weekly thing with the, instead of doing the once every quarter, why don't we try a weekly show? So we bumped, we, we did it. We went into this hotel, we struck this deal. We, we started the room. I had Ralphie May did our first, uh, our first week. I had tons of, you know, it was really, really good. Stan Hope worked at Titus worked at, like we we're putting good comics in a very horrible little city. And the it grew we moved to a brick and mortar things were fantastic uh and like tends to happen in the bar business my partner came down with a bit of a cocaine problem and then uh he embezzled a that goes of around from time to time it's weird it's so weird that he it just i don't know it's contagious it's uh it's been, there's no vaccine cocaine uh, COVID. it is i remember uh one night joey diaz <laughs> cocaine co cocaine it, joey diaz looked at him one night on a saturday it's just we're rocking it's pat diaz is headline in the room my, this dude, Lee, is in the back of the room, just his jaws moving like a 1940s typewriter. Just, rah, 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 and Joey Diaz looks at him and he goes, you want to get that $20 book out of your nose? That's great. <laughs> and then Joey went up and drank a bottle of Jägermeister and fell down on the stage. It was that's the bar business. You don't want to be in it. It was uh, they were wonderful years when I was in it. Some of my dearest friends uh, remain comics that came through that I didn't know before that. It gave me, uh, I was, the club was 2003 through 2007. So I had like five years in there where I had access to a stage anytime I wanted it. I was running a great open mic. People were coming in from Houston to do it. We had, I had four shows on the weekends. I could do one-offs if I wanted to. It was, I crammed years of stage time into those first couple and that to me is is the reason for doing it. It was never a mm -hmm. it was never a moment where I was like, I want to own a bar. There was just, you know, I'm in my twenties. That sounds cool, right? But I need this space. Like I'm building. Like if you want to be, if you want to train for for Mr. America or Mr. You know, Mr. Olympia or whatever, you you build a gym. What a wonderful sure. way to to make some money and work out. And that's just kind of all that was for me. Um, the cocaine part with the partner was, you know, lesson learned. <laughs> eh, you know what happens. It's a <laughs> yeah, what are you gonna do? Now, you've always, you, you've always had an entrepreneurial spirit. I mean, you uh, were involved in a, and you still are to some extent, in a, uh, a honey business. Mm -hmm. Honey. Bees. Uh, yes. Um, I also own a, a significant amount of a motorcycle rally in Houston. Uh, I get, I get. A motorcycle uh, rally? Yeah, we shut down okay. the center. Of, well, I mean, it's, it's not happening this year because of right. the obvious. Right. Uh, we shut down the center of Houston, uh, this major thoroughfare, Allen Parkway, that runs from downtown into into the uh, center, and it's it we yeah it's remarkable. We did thousands of motorcycles and uh, big big concerts, and it's it's a great view of downtown. So those kinds of things. What happens is I have I have friends in in a myriad of different uh, lines of work, right? Mm -hmm. Some of them own bars, some of them own restaurants, some of them are. In, in radio, some of them are comedians or, or directors or producers or all over the all over the, the the spectrum. So when we sit down together and have drinks or catch up, lots of different points of view. So one night over drinks, me and one guy who owned a bar and one guy who owned restaurants and one guy who ran this Buffalo Bayou Partnership, which is the River Conservatory down here that runs through Houston and the uh we're all talking and we're somehow the bees disappearing comes up someone's you know read that article about the bees disappearing and then someone goes why are the bees disappearing i don't know somebody google it that kind of drunk talk right <laughs> and then someone goes well that sounds interesting we should what if we should get a beehive and see how bees do the i forget what we were talking about at the time so we're like on i don't know if we bought it on amazon or somewhere but the next day a beehive 
shows up and then we're we're, suddenly bees we're like i guess we got to put bees in it so we put bees in it and then after a couple months you go well there should be honey in there so let's let's see and then there's honey and then you taste it you go shit that's good um let's 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 do the and it grew we bought a couple more hives and then the guy who ran the thing down by the river was wanted to watch him and his brother has a honey bit so next thing you know we're in whole foods and uh it's it's that's the kind of fun stuff i dig it's a uh, over, over a drunken conversation you can you can one learn a bunch of stuff about bees and honey and how all that's made in the different like i i know more stuff about honey than anyone ever should but two to turn that into a kind of a little passion project that you and some buddies can work around in your spare time. And all right, man, I'll, I'll come up with a Let's, let's come up with the branding and the imaging and play in all these little arenas. We don't normally play in. That's fine. Right. Yeah. But what ends up, you, but. <laughs> what ends up driving you with this stuff? Because it, what I like about you is that you, 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 comedy is obviously a very important part of your existence, but it's not your sole existence. No, but and, it's my, my first. It's my, yes. my wife and I have a, I cheat on it a lot. <laughs> well, like during the pandemic, I mean, everybody was shut down. Things are starting to sort of open up to some extent right now. I mean, if anybody deserved to have a little bit of a break, it probably was you because of the way you were just, I mean, scattered. Like, I mean, you're doing a million different things. Was there anything that came out of this? that helped you kind of funnel your energy into one direction? Yes. Uh, what was, what was very cool. I know how I work. Um, this has been, I'm, I'm a huge self experimenter. So I have to, I probably over the years trialed and errored my way through everything from working out uh-huh. to, to dietary stuff, to, to writing discipline, to, to all of that. Right. And what I, what I found is that I have to give myself projects that have a, have a certain end to them. I can't, I can't take on stuff that will last forever right now. That's, that's a big thing for me. Something has to have, I have to know that a I finite end to it. Otherwise it'll yeah. just, yeah. Cause you'll, cause the task will expand to fill the time that you give it every single time. So, right. and then two, it had to have um, measurable um, waypoints along the way had to be things that I could instantly see progress in, right? If your, if your goal is to, to get in physical shape, if you want, if you want abs, you, your goal for your measure for success cannot be abs, right? Like you have to, there have right. to be steps along the way where, sure. all right, well, the, the top two, if I could just see that first little bump, that's, that's achievable, right? Not full blown six pack abs. So for me, I wasn't looking to do this Thing that I wasn't going to be done with for forever. I, I did a series on creativity, um, a podcast called Eyes on the Ground uh, was the first thing I did. And it was 12 episodes. And I put um, a lot of guys that had di- uh, directors and, and actors and musicians and stand-up comics and some people that are in marketing and things of that nature and really started to pry into what was making them tick. And the cool part about that was, was – as I'm sort of feeling stagnant in this, the world is shut down. All these conversations I'm having with these people are prodding me along the way. I'm like, oh, I never thought about that like that. That's a, ooh, let me let me dig in from that perspective. Or you've got me thinking about writing stories in ways I hadn't really contemplated. So it's all of those. It gave me so much other stuff to play with in this. Dialogue. It was almost like you're like you were hosting your own masterclass. Yes, yes, and I I, I walked out of it. So much better off than I, it was, it was incredible. And then when we'd go back through, uh, I had a, um, a friend of mine scored it and he was, he's a brilliant musician, uh, Brian Carrion, and he kind of co-produced it with me in post. So we'd go in once a week, he'd come over and would sit down with an episode. And I, cause I wrote interstitials in there. It's not just a big full on interview. I go in and I kind of break down and it's very exploratory about the creative process. And Brian and I would go back and listen to these and would do the music and make sure it all fit and listening back to it gave me a chance to kind of be a, a participant in it as well as the the conductor and that was really cool so it's these weird little things sort of fire me up and as soon as i finished that i was like okay now with all of this accountability that these people have drummed into my head let me turn this into the second book and now that's where i'm you know forty five thousand words into it and yeah it's 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 just kind of about knowing how you function and what your what your own catalysts are and what 
Like I know my bad habits. I know I know how quickly I can go down a rabbit hole and justify it. Yeah, I have to research this because it's I'm gonna write a chapter about it six chapters from now, and all the answers are clearly on Reddit, aren't they? Right there. Yeah, let me. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm on the internet. It's, uh, it's right there on Reddit, right with your with your GameStop uh, stock <laughs> yeah, purchasing advice too. <laughs> exactly. How many of those kids have committed suicide, by the way? I, don't I know can't even talking about that number. Those no, they're not buying GameStop at 300 bucks a share and they're still sitting on it like it's going to go back up. I have hope, bro. That's done. That's done. Oh, yeah. They have hope. There's, Andy Dufresne had hope <laughs> and uh, and he got raped in prison for a long time before he finally swam through that sewer, that <laughs> drain pipe when those, when before he ended up before, <laughs> before he ended up in Zawatanejo. I remember when those GameStop boys first walked into Shawshank. <laughs> <That's> like... <laughs> the sisters had fun with them. <laughs> yeah. Ooh. You were friends with Ralphie May. You worked with him on the road for a while. And he passed away a few years ago. And um, what do people not know about him? I mean, he was just, he was Super, super funny. Everybody that I ever talked to said he was one of the nicest people that you'd ever run into. That more than what do that. people not know about him? His so Ralph, Ralphie one where where people have negative things to say about Ralphie. The only things that I consistently have heard um, are are accusations of theft. Um, I can't. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know who. Right. I don't know what bits people have written. I don't know what bits Ralphie wrote. I don't know that. I know that I have seen his writing process in action. Um, that part I can tell you. There was a night we were in um, Roswell, Georgia. This was the funny farm, so I guess outside of Atlanta, um, back when Marshall Childs had a great room. And I'm, it's just a two-man show, me and Ralphie. I had just broken up with the crazy girl, um, and Ralphie knew her. This would have been like February. So this right after February of that whatever year that was. We'd been broken up for a couple of months. She... He knew this lunatic that you were oh, that no. was oh. stabbing you and pushed you off a balcony and stuff like that. Not, okay. Not just knew her. Let me tell you this cocksucker. Let me tell you what he did. Uh, before I get back to the funny farm story, uh, we're in, he's in Beaumont playing my room. She and I at the time were sharing a car. I have my motorcycle. We're living together. Ralphie knows all these stories. He's known her for years. Um, right. He's at Papado's with Billy Wayne Davis. They're playing the club. They're having lunch. He calls me out. Hey, why don't you come have lunch with me, pal? We're just over here at Papa Does. Why don't you come have some food? And I go, hey, I'll meet you there. And I tell her, hey, I'm going to go have lunch with Ralphie. And she goes, you're not going anywhere. You're not leaving me stranded. You're just being her. Mm -hmm. You're not. Don't you be happy. Uh, that stuff. So I go, I'm going to go have lunch with my friend. And I get in the car and I leave. And I, I'm sitting there with Ralphie. And we're, we're waiting on the And my phone is just blowing up. And it's just her. And he's going. Why don't you answer it? I'm, I'm not answering the phone, dude. It's I'm, I'm she's nuts. I'm not getting into this. And he goes, just answer. And it rings again. I'm not answering. He goes, all right, let me talk to her. And uh, she calls again. I go, hang on. I go to hand it to him. He goes, uh-uh, player, that's your girlfriend. And he goes right back to his soup. I was like, you son of a bitch. <laughs> she, in the middle of that conversation, I hear my motorcycle start. She doesn't ride a motorcycle. I think, apparently, she must have ridden a dirt bike when she was a kid because she shows up at Papado's 20 minutes later on my motorcycle, loses it in the entire restaurant, throws cream, sugar. It's crazy. Uh, I go, I guess I'm going to leave. I'm trying to get out the door. Ralphie stops me, makes me pay for the dinner because I ruined it. That's Ralphie May. Uh, so, so Ralphie, I love. That's uh, great. We are in. We are in. Roswell. This must have been great sex. It's which is why you stuck with her as long as you did. There had to be. It's, it's, <laughs> there had to be. There's got to be some upside to this. Well, yes, story. but also you can't just leave when you want to. There's no. You know what I mean? People are like, why would you not leave? That's questions asked by people who've never been with crazy people. Because I did try. You know, it's not like I was like we're breaking up, and she was like no, and then. No, no, you got it. This, this, this is this is something that's done like when she goes out, and oh, you know, yeah. you know, she's gonna be gone for like at least four or five hours, and you got you got your friends, mm -hmm. you got oh, your yeah, bros, you, gotta, you got your bros right there. It's got to be yes. This is a a tactical strike. This is you got to come in like you're changing very, a set yes. in a play. Yeah, 
That's yes, this is yeah, this is coming in like SEAL Team Six on Bin yeah. Laden. You're like, okay, we need to converge on the household now. Someone needs a chopper. Someone's got to be out front with a gun because if she comes back early, we need yeah. to take out. We need to take out the subject. We all have one Lego piece. Ready? Go. No. <laughs> Me and six thousand of my friends. <laughs> Yeah, it uh no, so we're in so I'm in so Ralphie Newer, I guess is my point. We're okay. in Georgia. Uh I I had on on Valentine's night, she had come by my new apartment drunk, uh banging on the door. I didn't answer. I had just moved in. Uh I hadn't even unpacked. There was a box by the door that had a bunch of stuff in it, weird things, you know, just like um oversized stuff. There was right. there's probably a baseball bat and a sword, like weird, just you know, a golf club or a all kind of odd stuff. This and was I inside the door. Yes, in my house. I know. There's Which is good because if you're going to have some things by the door when this lunatic comes knocking, a sword, yes. a bat, and a golf club oh, are going to be three things that are going to be very helpful. So I hear the banging and I just reflexively do what you reach for, right? Why would you not? What's, what's, and it's the sword. And I go, okay, cool. I've got a, so I'm telling this story to Ralphie, right? And I'm going, I don't know that it's her. I just, in case, right? Like, I, in case it's not her. I've just got this. So just, and he stops me, he goes, a fucking sword, and I, I, I go, and, he, and then they call my, and I go, I have to go. Uh, I'll, I'll be, I'll be back. And I go up and I do my set, and then I introduce him, and he comes walking out, and he crosses, passes with me. He doesn't even, he just gives me a little tap as he shake side eyes me, and he walks up. He looks right at the crowd. He goes, "You ever learn something about friend of yours that that makes you question everything about your friendship? Because a friend of mine has a sword." For protection. What are you afraid is going to attack you? A Capital One commercial? What's next? You got to throw a falcon at him? Ah! This is rough, you know? So he did, Derek, he must have done 20 minutes on me and that sword. So sure, you can accuse Ralphie of having taken jokes. Again, I do not know. Um, right. I do know that I watched him write 20 minutes of live stand-up right in front of my face. And that's not even shit he kept. That stuff that was just there for the night. His ability to process comedy was incredible. Um, his heart was amazing. That was the that's probably my favorite story of all of them was when I had my club. I mentioned that he opened, he did my first right. Week. I booked him in April for that for that uh gig. It was August, I think, first or third, whatever that Friday was, um, was when he was scheduled to play. Now I booked him well before last comic standing. He calls me in May or so. Hey, I'm on this new show. You may want to mention it in the promo. Maybe it's going to be a big deal. Maybe it's not. Whatever. Cut to August. I can't get a hold of him. He's sequestered on TV. He's. I have him booked in between when they air the finals and when they announce the winner. That's literally. It's coming out on Tuesdays. I've got him on the biggest week of his career, and I've booked him for literally $1,200. Like it's not even a. Are you kidding me? Right. And I can't get a hold of him. So I'm in my sure. brain. I'm going, I, I've got a call. I'm booking back up. I'm trying to put stuff together. And that dude calls me. Uh, I forget how, how far before, but it was where my heart was pounding nervously. Uh -huh. And he goes, I just want to let you know, I'm not canceling. I also don't want any more money. I told you I do the show for this. I'm doing the show for this. And that dude came in and he did that show for exactly what we agreed on. Now we added some shows and he made some more money. Right. But it was the, the reality of it was, that dude didn't have to do that. They were throwing, they were throwing dollars at him in every city in, in America. And he had an agreement with his Well, that's what a solid family. that's what a solid human does and a good friend. You know, you don't do that to 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 people that you've you know been you know friends with but before all this stuff rolled down the pike. So I mean that's a that's a great story. I mean, it's sad that he's gone, but I mean it's great that you got some good memories like that. It was Tom Simmons texted me. We were he was another guy who did some time with uh Ralphie on the road. And yeah. the day he died, we were talking and kind of like this, just the some stories some people might not have known. And right. uh, Tom Tom goes, you know, he goes, a lot of people didn't understand him. He goes, if they walked a mile in his shoes, they'd understand some things about him they didn't get. He goes, they'd also be the first people to ever walk a mile in those shoes. <laughs> <laughs> We, 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 we died laughing, and I'm, that's exactly what Ralphie would have been right on board with us. So. Tom's hysterical. <laughs> Best writer Dude, I know. He's oh, my God. Dude, final question here. You can go into a uh, – you got a time machine at uh, in your storage unit because you probably had a time machine in your storage unit. That's why it was so expensive. You, you couldn't access it. 
I think a time machine is probably worth more than 2,500 bucks. So you probably should have ponied up the money to get in there and grab that time machine. I totally agree. Now, the big question is, is a time machine a singular thing or are there two ends to it? Is there was one end in the storage unit and another end outside the storage unit? So maybe I could get in it on this end and end up in the storage unit at a particular time. You, well, you could have got got into the storage unit and then it's gone back, th in. gone back 13 months. That's right. Paid off that credit card. And then you'd be able to get all your crap out of it. So so there's that. So you can just see, we need to have a lot more whiskey in these conversations and another three, <laughs> and another three or four more hours. But uh, time machine, if you can go into a time machine, where would you go and what time frame would it be? Man, this is 2016 was a remarkable year for me. Um, I, I, that whole year, and I don't know that I would change anything about it. Um, that wouldn't be my reason for going back. I just really do think that that stretch was so incredible. I would relive it over and over and over, um, knowing what I know now. I was on the back end of some emotional stuff, but I also managed to see Angra Wat Machu Picchu and the, the Great Pyramid in, in eight months. Like it was that crazy cool stretch of life for me. And I would I would just go back to relive those beats, I think. It was probably the best year in my adult life. Uh, there's also a stretch when I was maybe, there, I, I wanna say seventh grade-ish. Um, there were a lot of really bad things I think that were happening in my life at that time, but it was also a pivotal moment that again, I don't think I'd change stuff so much as I would just expedite things. I think I, right. I would wanna go back and just eliminate some of the stuff I wasted some time on so that I could get here faster. I like it. Dude, yeah. SlateHam.com is your website. People need to pick up the book until all the dragons are dead. Where can they find that? Uh, it's on Amazon. It's uh, I think you can go get it or order it in a bookstore even. So, uh, But it's it's everywhere. And uh, I do do autographed copies on my website. They take a little bit longer to ship. But, uh, you know, if you're into that kind of thing for your for your bookshelf. No, I mean, it's super cool. Until all the dragons are dead, you're special. The Whiskey Brothers, seen on Amazon Prime. Also, check out the Whiskey Brothers podcast, which is uh, which is fantastic. You can uh, you can hear them. Uh, you can uh, hear you guys. Who, who's all on the podcast? Does, is it a rotating cast? I know you're on there all the time. So I, I host it. Uh, the right Reverend Robert L. Mungle is uh, on it all the time as well. And had, he founded the Whiskey Brothers in 98. Uh, so I'm a bit of a train jumper uh, okay. in the middle of it. But uh, Sam Damaris is on with us uh, pretty much all the time. A young kid named Trey Tutson, who mark my words, you'll be able to go back and listen to this when he's on SNL or wherever the hell he ends up and go, oh, right. he was onto something. Um, and then we bring in a ton of guests right now that we're doing this. And a matter of fact, you're, uh, you'd be spot on. You need to come uh, do a Zoom episode with us because now that we have this three cam shoot and everything's set up the way it is, we're live switching. We can bring in guests from pretty much everywhere. So uh, I'm in. We're doing some really cool things. It's uh, and then you know I've got that the Eyes on the Ground podcast. If you do want to go back and listen to uh, some of the more serious take on creativity, uh, it's it's fun. There's some good guests on there. So, well, and people need to definitely check out your website, also your all your social media stuff too. Go back on your uh, Instagram stuff and look at some of the just brilliant photography. I mean, the work that you do is really, really, really super cool to see. And uh, I appreciate that. And man, I'll tell you what, Sladeham.com is his website. See him when he comes to a town near you. He's uh, all over the world doing stuff. So uh, so try and uh, try and capture him. Look for him in the Philippines in a, in a prison. <laughs> in a backseat of a cab. <laughs> in a backseat of a cab. Dude, good talking to you, buddy. Derek, I love you the most, bud. Thanks for listening to A Drink with Derek. Find out when Derek is appearing near you by checking out DerekRichards.com. See you next time for A Drink with Derek.